been to the hospital three times. We didn't have it twice and still trying to get over it. Turn your Bibles, Will. He was talking about the Southern Baptist Convention and all, and um, that's what we'll look at just for a minute this moment about, uh, or this morning, about men for God. And uh, look in first, or Ezekiel, rather, chapter 22 and uh, verse 30. A lot of other scripture I'd like to read, but I'm just, I'm not, for just time's sake, really. Because we're thinking about men. They're talking about the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, I remember when we had to battle, some of the older ones do, for the Bible. And uh, we had been averaging six or 7,000 in uh, the attendance at the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, the next year, it was planned, uh, trying to get everybody there we could, and we took a group out of our church and had 58,000 to show up. And uh, they had to go out and put them in other places. But we stood firm on the inspiration, the infallibility of the scripture. And I just thank God that you've got Brother Alex as your pastor, that he stands on the word of God and winning people to Christ. And that's what the church is all about. And yet we're living in a day when you look around in America that we need men that'll stand for God. We need young men that'll stand for God. A young pastor came to me recently and he said, what do I do in my church? He said, uh, we've got uh, a ton of young men now in our church. And I said, that's great. He said, but 80% of our tithes come out of the senior adults. He said, not many of our young men tithe. What do we do? And I told him, I said, that's what you're there for is to teach them how to be godly men. And I said so, and he's doing a great job with it. So look in Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. The prophet said, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you God for this church and their pastor Lord, for standing firm upon what you say in the Bible, the authority of the scripture, <coughs> the winning of our area to Christ. <coughs> Lord, there are so many in America that profess to be saved who have never received Christ as their savior. They've gone through the motions, but never met the master. Lord, they have a form of godliness, but not the power of God upon their life. And I pray, God, your blessings upon this church, the ministry, in reaching this area to Christ. And we'll praise and honor you. In your name we do pray. Amen. America is in the shape she's in, really, because of the church. Because of the church not standing strong for God and the, what God teaches in the Bible. If you look around, and I know you have, on what's going on in America, we're so far away from manhood. We're, we've lost the understanding of what God says in the Bible of how to live a life that is holy, <coughs> a life that is clean and pure. The church today, the average church today, has lost the power of God has lost the presence of God in the midst and the provision of God in the church. I was talking to a young pastor the other day and he was asking about growing up and uh, I went to my home church a few weeks ago and uh, to fill in and two years ago they had seven people left and that Sunday I was there, they had 300 in two years. God is waiting for men to stand up in the church and to stand upon what God says in the Bible, to learn what it means to be filled with the Spirit and to walk in the grace of God and to lead their families in such a way. We're in the shape we're in because the church has by and large lost our love for Christ. 
we are wanting our denominational thing. We fought for the denomination all these years. Uh, Brother Alex, no offense here, but I've been a Christian a little bit long, twice longer than he's been here. And most of y'all have, some of y'all have. I think I've been a Christian for 66 years now. And uh, my granddaughter said the other day, told me she's 13. She said, Papa, you've been a Christian 66 years. She said, you and Noah must have been good buddies. <laughs> and I told her, I said, you can shut your mouth and go on. <laughs> None of your business how old I am. But I think about being men, our families, as a pastor, I've dealt with over 8,000 families in counseling. Not as a counselor, but as a pastor and people coming and needing help. From about 38 states and several foreign countries, they've come. A missionary came that was with another mission board, Baptist Mission Board, had been on the field as a missionary for 16 years. The, his mission board had paid for him to come to Greenville and be here for two months with us for me to work with him and see what was going on. The first day he was with me, I led him to Christ. I always go through the plan of salvation with anybody. And he said, I asked him when he got, I got down to the end, I said, well, I'm sure you've already done this. He said, no, I've never done that. And he's been a missionary on the field for 16 years. So men, I want you to understand that what America needs is for men to stand for God to be godly in character and attitude and action and in deed. And as the home goes, men as your home goes, so goes the church and so goes the nation. The biggest problem in America is the absence of deads in the home, especially godly deads. In the present scripture, the Lord reveals the absence of moral and spiritual foundations in Jerusalem we're living in the same time period, almost, of lawliness, of a lack of morals. You look around at the kids and the way they dress today, and, and they talk back to their parents. And I heard a little girl at the store the other day, and she told her mother, she said, leave me alone, I'll not do what you say. I thought you might tell me that one time, but you wouldn't make the mistake twice. Uh, I would have wore her out right there. But then I saw another mother tell in the same store that day, tell their child, why don't you shut up and go on and let me do what I'm going to do. And daddy stood there and did nothing. When I think about God's call to be his man, we need to understand the times that we're living in and seize the moment of reaching our families with the gospel of Christ. You pray for a brother-in-law that I have that, of course, you know I've lost my wife in January and my, I've lost two sisters in the last year. And I've got a brother-in-law in the hospital that in two days had three strokes, but he's not a Christian. But when I go in, uh, all he wants to do, now he's a kind of a bruiser of a guy. He's a lot younger than I am and he's my youngest sister's husband, but you pray for him that he would be saved. Uh, that's what I'm praying. I, I want God to heal him if it could be God's will, but I want him to be saved. And that's the greatest need of his life. But we need to understand the times that we're living in and seize the moment. In the beginning, God created the man in his image to glorify him and to worship him and to honor him. Satan has done all he could. I can't remember the guy's name that played uh, Rambo. But he made a statement one day on television that I heard, and they were interviewing him and <coughs> asked him, said, uh, does your children go and see your movies? He said, oh, no. He said, uh, that's how I make my living, but I would never let my children watch one of my movies. In fact, he said, we don't even have a TV in our house. He said, because I don't want my children corrupted by all this stuff. Now, this is a guy that, you know, has been the tough guy all through the years. But if we're going to be that man that God wants us to be, if we're going to live, be a man that our wives, our children could look at and say, that's the kind of person I want to be, 
I will know God the same way my dad knows God or my mother knows God. If we're going to be that kind of man to seize the opportunity, <coughs> excuse me, those of you that know me know that coffee is just too much of military when I was in the Army. Uh, it's kind of like Tommy. Well, Greg back there, he can't help being Greg because he's in the service so long, you know, <laughs> and uh, got more service in him than he's got Greg. Um, I don't have that long in it, but I've had to live with the cancer and everything else from it. But if we're going to be the man God wants us to be, we've got to be a man that knows God. I've got to know God in the very depths of my heart. When we were here serving as interim, the thing that impressed me about this church were men that were in this church that stood for God. Great men of God. Churches where we have pastored. I had a man one time that retired from New Power, <coughs> 55 years old, to become our full-time outreach minister without pay. He retired so he wouldn't have to have an income from the church. And he said, I want to help reach people for Christ. <coughs> that was our first church there as pastor. And we got to be good friends and The church, the first few years before that, had uh, led five or six a year to the Lord and baptized five or six. At the end of that year, we baptized over 160. And it was a congregation about your size. And we wound up with, and, he, and evangelism is one of the things, with Jerry Falls head attorney for all his ministries and everything, the schools and all. He said, because you're interested in winning people to Christ, and I want to be a part of that. We've got to be a man that knows that we have been saved by God's grace. It amazes me how many men that I talk to that don't know whether they're saved or not. They'll use the term something along the line, I hope so. But the Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know you have eternal life. I've been a Christian all these years. When I came back from service, I only had, the only time I ever had a doubt about my salvation. And uh, I went to a pastor, a friend of ours, that had just become kind of like a second dad to me and became my mentor in the ministry. And I went up to him and I owed in Knoxville and I told him, I said, J.D., I said, I've really got doubts if I'm saved or not. JV JD took me up in a bedroom, and uh, he said, don't come out. He said, you know the plan of salvation. You've witnessed and witnessed and witnessed. Uh, at 16 years old, I'd go out with the men in our church on uh, Monday night or Tuesday night, whatever it was. I don't remember now. But we'd go out and soul winning. And so I'd led my first person to Christ uh, at that age when we'd go out and knock on doors. One man said, I don't want you here, and he slammed the door, and I was so bold back then that I opened the door back up, and I said, don't slam the door to my face, and uh, led him to Christ. He said, you can come in, but y'all stay out, and I thought, no. <laughs> if I'm going in, he may slam the door to and I won't get out. So they all went in there with me. But there's something I can know in my life. My daughter became a Christian when she was five, and she's 42. And, uh, but she's never had a doubt about her salvation. I went to a drugstore a while back for a pharmacy on uh, Pilersville Road, and the pharmacy came around, and he said, you're not going to believe this. We've been talking about your wife and your daughter. We know Jessica, and we know that she's such a godly young lady, but we know why she's that way, because she came from that type of home, and y'all raised her in that tradition. And so we understand why she is who she is. But men, you've got to make sure that you understand what God says about the Bible and that you have been born again. I had another pastor who had been in his church pastoring for 35 years <coughs> of a different denomination came to me and he said, I've got to have help. I said, all right, let's just talk. So we started talking and at the church I was at then and it has been many years ago and he was, at that time, much older than I was, and 
We just got to talking. Well, I just drew a circle diagram of body, soul, and spirit and began to go through the plan of salvation with him, which I do with everybody, and uh, went through it, and I began to share with him about how we're saved and why we need to be saved, that we were lost and in sin and on our way to hell, and I understand that Christ died the death of the cross and paid for my sin debt, was buried and rose again the third day, and I said, there's that day that I prayed and asked him to come into my heart. And I was going to ask this pastor, I said, have you done that before we went any further? He just wanted me to come and teach a seminar in his church. And I didn't really want to go because I didn't want to start. Uh, I believed in once saved, always saved. I believed Jesus died for everybody. And I didn't want to go over and start a ruckus in his church. I wasn't raised up believing once saved, always saved. But at 21 years of age, my wife and I studied doctrine for a year. And that's, why I, that's when I really decided at that point to become a Baptist pastor because our theology lined up together. So we've got to have a no-so salvation. If you don't know you're saved this morning, you need to settle that before you do anything. It doesn't matter what you accomplish in life, financially. Um, or what you do academically, what kind of degrees you have. I think the most degrees of anybody in our church we've pastored through the years. He had four doctorates, and uh, and he had how many masters? I don't know, but he had four different doctorates in different areas, and just studied all the time. And yet, when we talked about being saved, he didn't know if he was saved or not. And he had all of this background and all this understanding about the Bible. He had even written a book on theology of 780 pages on theology, but really didn't know if he was saved or not. So we've got to know for sure that we have been saved by the grace of God. Second of all, we've got to acknowledge the lordship of Christ. We have to die to self. God is in control, not us. He's in control of the church, isn't he? It's not our will, but his will be done. It's not what I want to do with my life. <coughs> But God, what do you want me to do? I always wanted to be a missionary. God spoke to me when I was about 11 years old about preaching. My mother is very wise. She said, that's great. You go play, and when God wants you to preach, he'll call you again. And he did the minute I got back from service. He spoke to my heart within that first month and renewed the call to preach. But then... Charlotte and I had, were already married, and later I asked her, I told her, I said, honey, I believe God's called me to preach, and I'm going to surrender to the ministry. And she said, I said, how do you feel about that? And she said, I've got it settled. She said, before you asked me to marry you, God told me you were going to ask me. And I had to settle something in my life. Would I agree to be a pastor's wife? And God told me that if I'm not in agreement to be a pastor's wife, don't marry you. But if, if we're in agreement and you'll do that, then God said it's all right. So we got married young in our life. We've got to have acknowledgement. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20 says, You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. The Bible says there's one Lord and one faith. Ephesians 5, 17, that we're to discover what is the will of the Lord for our life. We have to come to that point of acknowledging him and surrendering to the lordship of Christ. Third of all, we've got to have a total love for Christ. My daughter, I prayed for her every day. She got married when she was about 24, I guess. And, uh, but I prayed for her every day. And she would hear me pray. That she would be saved at an early age, which she was, but then I'd pray that she'd live a godly life. I'd go there in night, at night and lay my hands on top of her head and pray that God help her to live to become a godly young lady. To be that kind of young lady you want her to be. She told me recently, she said, Dad, I remember you coming in and laying your hands on my head when you thought I was asleep. And praying, but I was just waiting for you to come and pray. So I could go to sleep. 
because I don't ever go to sleep till after you pray. We've got to acknowledge the Lordship of Christ and have a total love for Him. We've got to have a clear conscience. If there's anybody that's offended toward me, I've got to seek their forgiveness. Or if I've offended anybody and I knowingly have done that, then I need to get their forgiveness. Probably the greatest sin in our church is the, is the unforgiving spirit. I'm not forgiving somebody that has offended me that may not even know they have offended me. Pastor, you probably have had this. Be at the front door of the church, somebody go out and you can tell they're mad. And I said, what in the world's wrong with you? Because I'm just kind of blunt that way. You know, what's wrong with you? You didn't speak to me when you come in the sanctuary. I had something on my mind. I didn't even know they were there. And I said, well, I'm speaking to you now. Does that count? No, because you've already hurt my feelings. I said, that's all right. Just go on out. And I kept brushing her on the shoulder. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm knocking the rest of the chip off your shoulder. I said, we got most of it off when you came in, and I didn't see you, but I'm, I don't want you to have any left. But then she became kind of like a second mother to us. She was an older lady, and uh, I took care of her as her pastor. She didn't have any children when she had cancer for a couple of years and with chemo and radiation and all that. But we've got to have a clear conscience. We've got to be a leader in our home for God. My dad wasn't a Christian, never went to church in my life. But my mother was just the opposite. She had played the piano for the Kingsman Quartet and filled in a few times and the Inspiration Quartet and uh, J. Harold Smith, if some of you older remember J. Harold Smith, uh, he had called her in the house and said, listen, my pianist um, can't come and could you come fill in and pray? And uh, so my mother had to step in and lead us and take us to church to show us how to worship. And so she would get up every morning at 4 o'clock. Never heard my dad pray in my life. But mother would get up every morning at 4 o'clock and take all of us kids and those on her prayer list, and she would pray for an hour every morning with eight children, my grandmother who was in bed with a stroke, and she would take care of all of us. But she would spend an hour in prayer and then studying her Sunday school lesson before she would feed, get ready to feed my daddy at five so he could go on to work. We need to be men of the home that don't ask our children to go to church. We take them to church. That we don't allow anything. <coughs> if we've ever gone, when we, I say if we've ever, when we go on vacation, we've always, and Jessica's understood that, that we go to church on vacation. Somebody said, well, that's our time to relax. How can you relax when you leave God out of the picture? We don't go on vacation. I'm debating about going with, of course, it'll be the first time in 54 years without Charlotte going to the beach, and, but maybe it's two or three days. But I'll be there on a Sunday morning and Sunday night, and I'll be in church where we would always go when we'd go to the beach over all these years. We've got to be a man that leads our children and takes them to church and does not allow anything to come between our children and their worship of God and church, being faithful in the house of God. Somebody said the other day, said, the church you're going to, which my son-in-law pastors, said, how many of y'all run on Sunday night? I said, well, what do you want to know for? They said, well, said, our church only runs half. Men, whatever, when you come to church on Sunday morning, unless you've got to work or somebody's sick or something, you ought to be in church taking your family. Amen? You ought to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Every other night the church is open. You ought to be in the house of God. We need to be not only leaders of worship, but we need to worship in faith. We need to understand that church for George's Creek take, takes place at a particular place or in a certain place at a particular time and that we're always here. David back there never misses, do you, David? Uh, 
You're going to be here tonight, aren't you? Oh, I'm just checking to see if you was listening. <laughs> but y'all be in the house of God. Now, I've not been able to preach much lately because I can't stand up long. But I've not missed except when the doctor says with COVID, don't go out among people. And I didn't want to give it to them having lost my wife to COVID. I didn't want anybody to get it from me or my daughter or my grandchildren or anything. But we need to worship in faith. We don't try to rationalize a way that I'm just tired, that I need to rest or be somewhere else. It needs to be us. We need to be a leader of worship that delivers. Do you know that worship will free you from bondage? A U.S. Navy admiral came to my house one night years ago at 11 o'clock, and news had just come on. That's why I know the time. My wife and I were sitting there, and another man that had flown in that afternoon, a friend, was sitting there. And uh, I heard a Volkswagen van, and if any of you have heard that, you know they got their own sound. The Volkswagen van drove up in the driveway, and I went out to look, and uh, this guy gets out, and he said, I'm U.S. Navy Admiral so-and-so. He said, I'm from this country. I'm over the naval base there, and they don't know I'm gone. I found a book that I think that that man could help me with my problems I've had all my life, and I can't find him. Even the guys at my base have looked for him, and my, those guys that work in intelligence, they can't find him. And, of course, it was just the Lord working it out that way <clears throat> because he lived in Denver, Colorado. He had uh, worked with Charles Stanley for numerous times and taught in his church over and over. But he said, I wish I could find that man, but a man on the base gave me your name, your address and phone number where you pastored and said, if I'd come talk to you, you could help me. And so he said, I'm here. He said, so I need, since I can't find Charles Solomon, he said, I want you to see if you can help me, if you don't mind. I know it's late, but I've got to catch a four o'clock ship back to my base before they discover I'm AWOL. He said, it's not good for the commander. Greg, you understand that, don't you? It's not good for the commander to be AWOL. And I said, you really want to talk to that man? And he said, yes. I said, well, I got a call this afternoon from that man. He said, you're kidding. He said, where's he? He said, I can't get there. So he said, I'm going to talk to you. I said, no. I said, he told me he just felt like he ought to come. I said, well, come on, because it always stay with us. I said, so he's sitting. He flew in from Denver. Sue, his wife, didn't come. I said, he's sitting on the couch watching news in the den. So if you want to talk to him, and when we're talking about Worship that delivers and worship will free a man from bondage of all kinds. They talk till, I don't know, from 11 till about 1.30. And the man had problems that he had dealt with all of his life. But all of a sudden he's free. Because he had been saved by God's grace. But Jesus was not Lord of his life. God didn't have control of his life. But he gave it to God that night, and God set him free. We need to be men, not only that lead in worship. You know why your pastor needs you men? So you can lead this church spiritually to worship God. In Georgetown community up here, in the last few weeks, three families, people are moving in this area out of California and New York like crazy. This is a fast Fourth fastest growing area in America, in the Greenville area. Spartanburg, down to Anderson, down below. So there's no reason you can't reach people. Three of these families from California, they moved in in about two weeks' time. The people are there. So we need to be men that lead and worship in our church so that we can cause our church to be evangelistic in sharing the gospel door by door, winning people to a saving knowledge of Christ. And men, let me tell you this, if you'll win a man, in, man to Christ, you probably will lead his wife and his children right along. They'll follow suit. We need men that know how to pray. And I don't mean now I lay me down to sleep or just drive into the grocery store. 
We need men that'll get down on their knees. If you want God to move in this service, in every service in this church, the men in this church need to be on your knees praying that God would move in the services here in a marvelous and a mighty and a powerful way. We need to know the power of God. And it's unleashed through men and women, boys and girls, that pray for God to move. Preacher Alex would tell you, if you could do anything for him, do one thing, pray. I'd rather have somebody praying for me than do anything. I went to church here today and they gave me a large check honorarium and I thought, man, I don't give nobody that for preaching revival. And uh, I said, I don't want it. Uh, I'm retired and I just thank the Lord that I you know, don't have to have it right now. And uh, I always tell people like Brother Alex this morning, just keep, I just give you an IOU. And if Tommy calls me to go out and eat again, I gotta pay for his lunch, I can, ha I can get it and pay for it, amen? <laughs> no, Tommy, let me say this. Tommy has been a real Christian friend. He's called me, checked on me, called the other day and said, go out and eat. And I've just in the last three weeks been able to go out and eat and be able to walk from the car and sit down and eat and get back to the car just in the last three or four weeks. I couldn't walk that far, I couldn't stand this long. But he's been a real friend. You've got men in this church that are godly men that want to walk with God and do it God's will in God's way. It's not our opinion, it's God's opinion and God's will. We've got to have a commitment as men to the Bible, the Word of God. And I'm, it thrills me to death to hear a pastor say that I believe in the authority of the Scriptures. Every word. I don't, folks, I'm going to tell you, there's not a mistake in here. It is the Word of God. If you want to know the answers to life, years ago I had a police chief in one of the most major cities in the southeast came up to my church and brought a little girl that had plucked every eyebrow and every eyelash. Her dad worked in the White House. The police chief said, one of my deputies told me to bring her down here. We didn't want anybody up there to see her. We'd take her to the hospital and just use a different name and dad's just gonna pay for it there, and get it covered. But trying to figure out what was going on and we were able to bring her to a saving knowledge of Christ. And once she got saved, the next time I saw her, her and her dad came to the church. And they came up and knocked on the door. The secretary let them in. And I didn't recognize the girl because when I saw her, she was just bloody. She pulled every eyelash and every eyebrow out with tweezers, just pulled them out. And just raw skin, just raw. But everything had grown back, and she's a beautiful little girl, 16 years old. And she said, but I'm going to tell you, the day I prayed with you and accepted Christ, and I'm trying to think, well, I don't remember praying with her because I didn't recognize her, and I didn't know dead, because dead didn't bring her. The police chief did. She said, but Christ has changed my life. And I went back and told my dad, and we didn't go to church, and my dad had become a Christian when I told him what I did, and I was sorry for what I did, and God forgave me. And so my dad has not missed a service in church since, not a service, since he gave his life to Jesus Christ. We need to be men that pray, that we stand strong and pray. We need to be men that have pure lives that are holy before God. We need to be, be men that would forgive those who may have offended us. We need to be men that are separated to God from sin. We need to be men where our word is our bond. The younger people don't remember this. I, I found going through some, just going through papers um, from my dad, and I remember that date. Dad bought a car from over here on Buncombe Road, and uh, daddy said, I can pay you this so much money a week for this many weeks, and it'll pay for it, and the interest, and they shook hands, and that was it. But then I found the paper where Daddy had paid the car off, and it had written on the paper the receipt. He honored his debt, no contract, we shook hands, and he paid it off. 
My dad had this about him, that whatever he told you, you could take it to the bank. He would honor it, whatever he said. And men, we need to be like that today. We need to honor who we are and what we say. And our time's getting by here. Let me just, let me just say this. We need to be men in a family. We need to be family men. Protect our wives, our children. Um, I had a couple tell me the other day, my oldest granddaughter is 16, and um, her best friend is 16, and the little girl's mother and daddy came up and said, hey, he said, you've offended our, our daughter. I said, how did I offend her? She said, you hugged Emily, but you didn't hug her. And you kissed Emily right there like you usually do her, but you didn't do her. And you've got to understand that you're not her real papa, but you're papa. And you've got to go find her and hug her and kiss her so that everything at home is all right because she's wounded. Men, you can wound your children in a minute. All you've got to do is tell them, I don't expect you to do that. You're too stupid. You're too dumb or whatever. And there's never an excuse to slap a child or hit a child. Amen? Amen? Never. We need a man that can raise our children to become masculine sons and feminine daughters. Someone once said men are more careful about raising dogs than they are their children. When I started out in the ministry, I was a lot younger in my first pastorate than Brother Alex. And I went down there, and I'd always prayed, God, don't let me go to Georgia or North Carolina. I thought God understood. <laughs> when I'm praying that I want to stay in Greenville, but God didn't get it. He sent me to Florida to pastor. But I learned right quick, being away from everybody, that if the church was going to go, I had to be a man of God, not a preacher or a pastor, but I had to be inside a man of God. We've got to be with our children and take care of them and love them. And uh, listen, you need to take your children, men, and look, talk to them. Look at them eyeball to eyeball when you talk to them. You need to hug them. I got a boy that I was at, I'd led to Christ. He was a drug dealer. As a drug dealer, he was also youth director in his church, or worked with the youth director in his church, sang in the choir, and worked in the youth department. But he averaged about 33500 a month, clear, selling drugs. He came to me, and the family got him to come to me, and he walked in and told me the first thing. He said, I don't want to be here. And he said, I'm sitting here. He said, just impress me. I said, okay. So I just got on the phone and called Charlotte to see if she wanted to go to lunch. She said, yeah. I said, I'll be over there in a minute. Well, I didn't really call her. I didn't call anybody. And the boy looked up and said, well, I thought she was going to talk to me. I said, no, you told me to impress you, so I, I'd rather impress my wife if I'm going to impress somebody. But I led him to Christ that day. I went out to the mall, Charlotte and I, I don't know, maybe a year later, whatever it was, and somebody grabbed me from behind. Now, you know, if somebody at the mall grabs you from behind, even years ago, it kind of scares you. And he had his arm all the way around my neck. And he kissed me. You could tell he was a lot bigger than I was. He kissed me on the cheek. And I'm, that did scare me. And uh, I looked around and saw who it was. He said, I just got to tell you, we just had our first child, and I named him James after you. He said, my life has been so different after I gave up selling drugs, he said, I went and got a job, and I knew that, for $7 an hour. He said, because I was determined to raise my children the way God wants me to raise them. And he did that. They're, well, one of them's finishing up college, I think, this year. We need to be, I'm going to just finish up here, we need to be a man in our church. 
We need to be such godly men that we accept spiritual leadership in our churches. That our pastor could call us and say, I want to trust you. I want to, you to do this and know it's going to be done. Because, men, I want you to understand this. You're not the pastor. He is. God put him here to lead this church, not you. So you need to listen, and if he asks you to do something that maybe you're not equipped with. I remember when I was about 17 or 18, my pastor said, we're going to help a church that's going under. And I want you to go over there, and I want you to preach some on Sundays. I said, not me. But I did. He said, no, you said you were going to follow me as your pastor. I said, oh, I am. He said, well, are you going to follow or not? I said, okay. I went over that Sunday, and I probably preached 15 minutes. Scared me to death. Now, I'd already preached starting at 16, but it scared me to death. And it really scared me when the music director got up and says, Brother Jim, we're so glad you're here. We're looking forward to having you back tonight. I said, my pastor didn't ask me nothing about tonight. He just asked me about this morning. He said, no, you're supposed to be here from now on. So we did. And the church, the pastor, our pastor helped him and our church did. But you need to be spiritual men. In the church serving. Be out witnessing. I mean, we'd go out. Well, Alex, we'd go out on Saturday mornings here and uh, we'd have, I don't remember, Teresa, what we'd have 16 or Steve, we'd have, what, 16 or 20. Every Saturday morning, we'd go out and visit. Had brochures printed up. We'd pass out brochures and do mail outs and all that. But all we had to do was ask them to come and we had men that would come and bring their wives and bring their children and they'd come. So I'm going to close here, but if we're going to win our nation back to Christ, if George's Creek Baptist Church is going to be the church that God wants you to be, if you're going to win this area to Christ, and God puts you here for a reason, and that is to win this area to Christ, fill it to overflowing. Fill it to overflowing. You said, I don't believe you can do that. That's what they said in the first church we pastored. They said, you can't do that. We, our church can't grow. And we had moms and dads on this side that had not talked to their children for 10 years. Because everybody on this side were mad at everybody on this side. Uh, we had a revival one day in our church. When they discovered I had cancer and I got up and shared with the church and I said, they've given me one to two days to live at the most. Because it's all around my brain and um, I just can't make it. I said, so I'm going to take Charlotte back to South Carolina to her mom. So she'll be with mama when I die. And some of the men looked around and they said, no, if you won't do it. We prayed with you last night and we believe God's healed you. And they prayed that morning from 11.15 till 2 o'clock. Had me on the altar and prayed. And the oldest lady in the church Miss Henry Aiken walked by and laid her hand and said, I've never been anything like this in my life, but I believe God's healed you of your cancer, and he did. And I still take medication. But to men in my church, when I said I was going to resign, they said, we'll make you a promise. We'll, if you die, we'll take Charlotte back to South Carolina, and we'll, now this is back in the early 70s. We'll build her a three-bedroom brick house, two-bathroom. We'll pay her your salary for the rest of her life. She won't ever need anything if you just won't resign. So I agreed that morning to stay. And I'm still here all these years later. You see, the doctors know some, but they don't know it all. They don't, unless they know him. Are you going to be that kind of man that God wants you to be? Let's stand with every head bowed and every eye closed. Let's pray together. Our most gracious Heavenly Father is the Holy Spirit speaks unto our heart. God, I pray that you'd speak to all the men and the ladies and the young people in this church that, God, that we would make a commitment and a decision to be godly men and women, godly boys and girls, totally, wholeheartedly reserved, committed to you. And God, now I pray that if we're not already in that state, that we'd come this morning 
and talk to the pastor or just kneel here at the altar and give everything to God that he may be glorified in and through us. Well, Alex, if you'd come.